It was my opinion that the course of the U.S. embarked on in the latter part of the 20th century would bring us a major financial crisis and engulf us in a foreign policy that would overextend us and undermine our national security. To achieve these goals, I saw it, the government would have had to shrink in size and scope, reduce spending, change the monetary system, and reject the unsustainable costs of policing the world and expanding the American empire. The problems seem to be overwhelming and impossible to solve, yet from my viewpoint, just following the constraints placed on the federal government by the Constitution would have been a good place to start. Just how much did I accomplish? In many ways, according to conventional wisdom, my off and on career in Congress from 1976 to 2012 accomplished very little. No name regulation, legislation, no name federal buildings or highways, thank goodness. In spite of my efforts, the government has grown exponentially, taxes remain excessive, and the prolific increase of incomprehensible regulations continues. Wars are constant and pursued without congressional declaration, deficits rise to the sky, poverty is rampant, and dependency on the federal government is now worse than any time in our history. All this with minimal concerns for the deficits and unfunded liabilities that common sense tells us cannot go on much longer. A grand but never mentioned bipartisan agreement allows for the well-kept secret that keeps the spending going. One side doesn't give up one penny on military spending. The other side doesn't give up one penny on welfare spending. While both sides support the bailouts and the subsidies for the banking and the corporate elite. And the spending continues as the economy weakens and the downward spiral continues. Whether your plan is to bug out or bug in, CampingSurvival.com has all of your preparedness needs, including fish antibiotics, long-term storage food, water filters, bug out bags, and first aid kits. Use coupon code PREPPERRECON for 5% off your entire order at CampingSurvival.com. Our individual first aid kits are now on sale. They're Molly compatible pouches in Coyote, ACU, OD, or Black. They're equipped with an Israeli battle dressing, quick clot, TK4 tourniquet, suture kit, and lots of extras. It's perfect for your car, bug out bag, or home first aid kit. Go to the PrepperRecon.com homepage and click on the IFAC store tab at the top of the page. They're on sale for $89 and that includes shipping. This kit could save your life. Hey preppers and patriots. Today's show is a rebroadcast of my guest appearance on the Secrets of the Survivalist radio show with Rick Austin, the Secret Gardener. Enjoy the show. Good morning, and welcome to this week's Secrets of the Survivalist radio show. I'm Rick Austin, author of The Secret Garden of Survival, How to Grow a Camouflage Food Forest, as well as The Secret Greenhouse of Survival, How to Build the Ultimate Homestead and Prepper Greenhouse. And I'm your host here for the next hour. Each week, I talk to the best off-grid prepping and survival experts and discuss their own secrets of survival. From retreat construction to self-defense to growing food, each week you learn something new that you can use for your own survival preparedness. Today, our guest is Mark Goodwin of Prepper Recon Podcast and PrepperRecon.com. Mark is a Christian author, and a, well, I'm sorry, a Christian constitutional author and the host of the popular Prepper Recon Podcast, which interviews patriots, preppers, and economists each week on PrepperRecon.com to help people prepare for the tough times ahead. Mark holds a degree in accounting and monitors macroeconomic conditions to stay up to date with the ongoing global meltdown. The troubling trends in the political and financial landscape have prompted him to conduct extensive research within the area of preparedness. Mark's first trilogy, The Economic Collapse Chronicles, uh, he weaves his knowledge of economics, politics, prepping, and survival into an action-packed tapestry of fast-paced, post-apocalyptic fiction. Welcome, Mark. Good to have you on the show. Rick, it's good to be here, man. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, glad, to, glad to have you. You and I are both participating in the uh, Summer Survival Series, and I'm glad we had a chance to do this. Um, it, you mentioned uh, in your bio that you were a Christian constitutional author. That must be pretty interesting times for you right now with all that's going on uh, constitutionally. And, and um, from the... Uh, uh, the 
the anti-Christian sentiment it seems in this country. Indeed, I think that uh, both of those uh, ideologies are pretty much under attack. Yeah, I I, I would agree with you. Um, it's, it's rather scary, I think. <laughs> so, let me ask you, Mark, what what woke you up to the need to prepare? I would say the first thing that that woke me up was nine uh, eleven. I think that that for a lot of folks uh, snapped a lot of people out of their normalcy bias and made them understand that we're not really as safe as we thought we were. Because uh, for my generation, uh, people that have never seen Pearl Harbor or uh, any any type of an attack on on American soil, I think that that was really scary and it really woke a lot of people up. And uh, I actually had uh, a guy on my show, uh, Zion Prepper, once, and, and and he was in New York right after 9-11 and he just gave, he just really gave a, a, a chilling um, explanation of, of what it was like for him and how people were just, uh, gas station employees were just locking the doors and walking away from the, from the gas pumps. And, and it was, it was horrific. And I was in, uh, I was actually living in Miami at the time and, uh, and it just shut down, uh, especially Miami at that time was very, very reliant on international tourism. And so after the plane stopped, you know, uh, commerce stopped. So it was, it was, it was really, really frightening. And, uh, and then I guess like most people, I sort of, uh, got lulled back to sleep a little bit until uh, 2008. Um, and then the housing market crash, I think that really, really shook me and, and woke me up. And I've pretty much stayed awake since that since that episode. And uh, I think the scariest thing about the 2008 housing bubble was that I didn't really understand what was happening, why it was happening, and uh, you know how bad it could get. So I, I really sort of dove into economics uh, after that, and and started really just eating up every little bit of information I could. Uh, got a lot of good stuff from Frontline. They put out a lot of good information. I know that they're a little bit uh, sort of left leaning. PBS is, but uh, of all the mainstream media outlets out there, I would say PBS's Frontline is probably one of the most informational programs on television. Um, so uh, I, I started uh, getting really into economics after that and just reading everything I could find about it. And the more I read, I, I think the the more I understand that uh, I, I'm doing the right thing by, by being a prepper. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because things aren't getting any better. And they're not, they're not, they haven't changed any of the things that they, that they did wrong to cause that crisis. And in fact, most everything they've done has uh, pretty much exacerbated uh, the crisis. And uh, we're running out of, we're running out of ammunition to, to uh, stem off another attack if we, if we have another, another meltdown. And, you know, one of the biggest problems that we had was, well, the banks were too big to fail. So what did they do? They merged them into bigger banks. So, I mean, it's just uh, it's just insane. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it's absolutely insane. Um, speaking of insanity, and and uh, you know, knowing what it's like to to uh, do a uh, preparedness radio broadcast, when did you when did you start the the Prep and Recon podcast? I started the website about two years ago, and I ran it as just a blog for about a year. And then uh, last year, uh, it was almost about a year to the date that uh, I ran my first episode. And so now I've been running the, the show for about a year. That's great. So what, why, did you, uh, why did you start it? What, what, got you, uh, what got you motivated to do that? Well, I think I started the website because I wanted to educate people and, and get people to wake up. And then when I started doing that, I started finding finding out how much I was learning from the process because uh, if you're going to be doing a show or a blog or, or writing books or anything like that, you've got to do a lot of research and you've got to really know your topic before you get on air or write your blog or publish your book. So um, I started doing a lot of research and I started learning so much and it's just been uh, it's been a great adventure and, and I guess that's one of the main reasons I do it. I, I, I started doing it because I wanted to help other people start waking up, but but uh, in the process, I'm learning a lot myself. 
I'd have to agree because, um, you know, I've been doing it for a long time, and I was a prepper and so-called survivalist long before they they coined those terms. Um, you know, so it's and I've really been like that as, as long as I can remember from Boy Scouts on, really. And um, you know, I've always tried to be prepared for disasters and that kind of stuff. But um, I would say that the the radio show has really, you know, you know sometimes I. I I'm afraid that I think I know it all, and uh, I always, I'm always learning something new from my guests that just surprise me. So, yeah, it's a, it's a great educational experience for my, for, you know, for the people that listen to my show and for me, and uh, you know, hopefully I'm, I'm giving something back too. So, so tell me, who have been some of your favorite guests? Oh, uh, there's been a lot of them. Um... James Rawls, I guess he's one of the people that was very instrumental into my awakening and uh, and getting me on board with prepping was uh, reading the Patriots series. I really, really enjoyed the Patriots series. He's also, also probably very instrumental in me becoming a uh, uh, dystopian slash uh, prepper author. Uh, I, I suppose his books had a lot of influence on that as well. Um, Glenn Tate. He's just he's just fun and he's he's a funny guy and just uh just just a riot to have on the show. So uh, I always love it when Glenn Tate comes on the show. Um John Rubino, which uh he's also I've read uh I read his book and uh he's also been very instrumental in helping me to sort of wake up to the collapse. So I've I've gotten to actually interview a lot of these people that have sort of been my educators and sort of been my my uh, teachers and mentors via the internet and via their books and things, and uh, and uh, it's it's really really been a pleasure to get to to speak with those people. Also, David Morgan, uh, I, I I listen to him anytime he's on another podcast. I'll always uh, put that on my my iPod to take it to the gym with me or to go out and and do yard work and things like that. And I think that's another reason that I started the podcast because I am a podcast junkie. And I love listening to podcasts, and uh, I also love listening to audio books. And so, when when I wrote my first book, it was in my mind. It was it was you know I was just transcribing this audio book that was in my mind, you know, because uh, I'm just a, I'm an audio book junkie and a, a podcast junkie, and that's that's really my favorite way to consume information. Um, Southern Prepper. Uh, he's a great guest as well. Lots of good information from him and, uh, Doug Casey. And, and I always listen to the, the Casey research videos on YouTube or anytime, uh, Doug's on another podcast, I'll, I'll put that on my player and take that to the gym with me or commuting or, or whatever. I have to say that, um, you know, I've had some similar experiences, obviously some really great guests and, um, uh, you know, uh, James Wesley Rawls was a was a great one for me too, uh, and uh, you know I had I had read uh, you know Patriots and just kind of thought it was spot on and thought it was brilliant that he used a, a novel to sort of get the point across and teach people stuff and you know there's just so much information in that book about you know what to buy and why if you are a pre- prepared, just minded person and. Um, was just it was great for me because I get contacted by his publicist um, who you know they were promoting his his newest books expatriates and uh, so I got a chance to you know read an advanced copy and uh, interview him from the sh- for the show and uh, you know it was great and I I know that uh, <clears throat> both of us hail from from Florida and uh, a lot of his newest book takes place down there in fact I live not far from from uh, the little town of Tavares, where uh, a lot of that book takes place, so it's, it was just really and um, really interesting and really fun, and it's been uh, it's been a great ride so far for me too. So um, you just finished your third book. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, it's called American Reset, and it is the final chapter in the Economic Collapse Chronicles. Um, I started the. the first book probably about a year ago i should probably go back to the beginning and and start with that to to give everybody that's not familiar with the series a little a little insight about what it's about um i try to use dystopian fiction to look at the real political and financial problems our country's facing because they're 
they're legion. <laughs> they really are. Um, we're just uh, on the left and the right. I think we've got a lot of uh, really, really challenging uh, issues that we're going to have to work through if we're going to survive. And I don't, I don't really see the political will to address any of those issues. Um, I guess I, I should probably state that if I had a, if I had one other person that I could get on the show that hasn't been on the show that I could say, okay, I can check that off my bucket list. It'd probably be Ron Paul. And, uh, I'm sort of, a, a an awakened neocon. I, I used to really believe that, you know, we had to have war all over the world and we had to control everybody else and, and be the policeman in the world. And, uh, but I, but I understood that, that Ron Paul had a, a really good understanding of economics and, and I thought, well, he's really got some great economic ideas, but he's a little out there on his foreign policy and things like that. And so I started reading his books. Uh, I read uh, Liberty Defined. I read Revolution. Um, one other one that uh, I can't I can't grab the title of in my mind right now, but uh, I, I read I read three of his books, and it really really I started to sort of see where he was coming from, and it started to open my mind to say, you know what? Constitutionally, we just we really don't have the authority to do a lot of the stuff we're doing, and 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 when I look at it. A lot of it is not, uh, it's not stuff that uh, we're not doing what we say we're doing because a lot of it's done under this guise of promoting democracy. And it's like, well, maybe if we had the extra money laying around and we weren't $17 trillion in, in debt, maybe we could afford to actually do some of this uh, sort of uh, uh, democracy promotion that, that we say we're doing. But uh, of course, when you when you look at the founding fathers, you know we we weren't really set up as a democracy. We were set up as a republic. So uh, you know, it's it's almost like uh, the the ideology of the founding fathers was almost hijacked to get us to the place that we are right now. This is very very different from from what they had in mind. Um, and uh, and if we look at if we look at things like Saudi Arabia, we prop up Saudi Arabia militarily. But, uh, you know, is that in the interest of democracy? Because there, if you're a Muslim and you convert to Christianity, you can be killed for that. Uh, women aren't allowed to drive and no one's allowed to have a Bible. You're not allowed to have a Bible anywhere inside the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So uh, uh, that doesn't sound very democratic and it certainly doesn't sound very republic. And, uh, and we spend a lot of money to, to prop that up. And, and it doesn't really sound like it's in the interest of, of democracy. So uh, that's that's one of the that's one of the things that I try to peel out in the book is to sort of look at some of our, our foreign policy issues and look at some of the political issues and some of the places that we've gotten really really off track. And then unlike probably a lot of the other prepper fiction books that that you'll read out there. I try to really, really delve into the economics because I think that that's probably going to be our Achilles heel. And I think that that's the thing that that we don't have the political will to to solve the economic problems. And I think an economic collapse is probably uh, the most likely problem that we're going to be facing over the next decade or two decades. And uh, so it, it starts out with a, a couple in South Florida. Um, the stuff hits the fan. Uh, the government's spending and monetary creation sort of hits a wall, and people aren't. Uh, the government's not able to continue that that rate of monetary creation, and uh, the first thing that happens is that uh, EBT cards aren't fully funded. Well, we've got this entire sub society of uh, Americans that have been taught for generation after generation after generation that they can depend on the government for every single thing from cradle to grave. And, uh, and, and they're not stockpiling rice and beans and they don't have any gold and silver stashed away anywhere and they have absolutely no means of getting by for one day without government assistance. So the minute that spigot gets turned off, 
those people are going to be rioting in the street. And it's just, it's just, uh, I, I think that the, the veneer of society is very thin. And I think when it cracks, I think it's going to get very, very ugly, very fast. And I try to portray that in the book. So this, this couple that lives in South Florida, they're preppers, but they're not really the, they're not the level of prepper that they thought they were prior to the collapse. So they find out that, that they are very, very unprepared compared to, to, uh, what the situation calls for. So they have to scramble to relocate. Uh, they're forced to sell their house way below market value. They take a big hit on that, but they, they take what they can from it uh, because they do have sort of the foresight that, that to know that, uh-oh, things are really, really getting ready to, to get bad fast, and, and this is just going to be a tsunami of chaos that's getting ready to pour down our heads, and we've got to get out of here right now. And so they do that, and they sort of cut their losses and uh, head up to the hills of Kentucky where uh, where uh, one of the character's cousin lives. And so they go up there, and they get a, a, a farm just uh, two or three miles away from his, and uh, they start doing what they can to to get by, and then the storyline also follows a independent uh, presidential candidate that sort of splits the vote, and uh, he pulls some people from the Republicans and pulls some people from the Democrats. But and he 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 doesn't get the the required 270 electoral votes to to win the the uh, election through the electoral college, so. Uh, the Senate has to go in and vote, and of course uh, they play politics and they don't honor the will of the people, and, and he's not elected, and this creates a schism in the country, and the person that is elected steps in with uh, some very, very totalitarian gun laws and uh, some very totalitarian ways and means of, of dealing with the collapse, and I think that's something that we always see. Um, Anytime we have a, a natural or a man-made disaster, we sort of see the, the government stepping in and making the wrong decisions. After, after the Boston bombing, I, I'm sure you're probably aware, you probably saw some of the YouTube videos of the police going through Watertown, house to house, uh, not kicking in doors, but knocking on doors and going in SWAT, SWAT team style and dragging people out of their homes with their hands on their heads. And you've got 60-year-old men and 80-year-old women coming out of the house with their hands on their head. And when they start to take their hands down to explain that there's nobody in the house, the, the, the AR-15 goes in their face and get them back up, get them back up, get them back up. And then these people that are obviously not this 19-year-old kid that they're looking for from the Boston bombing are escorted two houses down, and this is all in the video, and then they're frisked as if there would be some crime for them having a, a weapon. And I think that if there were ever a day in the history of America that you wanted your citizenry to be armed, that would have been a really good day for them to be armed. You know, unless you're writing them a ticket because they don't have a gun on them, you know, that's just wrong. Everything they did there was wrong. And uh, and then we also saw it after Hurricane Katrina. We saw house to house gun confiscations and, you know. Uh, I don't think that the the Second Amendment is subject to a weather event, but you know, that's the that's what we see with uh, with the government anytime there's a natural or a man made disaster. So I, I I'm afraid that if we do have this level of economic collapse, that that we're not going to be able to depend on the government to do the right thing in that situation just because of their track record. And I don't think that's really conspiracy theory. I just think that it's. Uh, it's just it's the it's the trend, and we we see them preparing. We see them getting ready with with MRAPs and billions of rounds of ammunition and stockpiling food. And uh, probably the biggest prepper on the planet right now is the U.S. government. And then uh, we also get the perspective of a uh, a pastor up in uh, Boise, Idaho. And uh, he's doing what he can to get his flock to prepare for, for the collapse and, uh, and move them out of the city and uh, to sort of a little prepared community uh, on a farm a few hundred, a few, yeah, about a hundred miles outside of Boise. 
And we're back with the secrets of the Survivalist Radio Show. We have Mark Goodwin, who is an author, a, a Christian constitutional author, and the uh, the guy who runs Prepper Recon Podcast and PrepperRecon.com. And uh, we've been talking about his his latest book. Um, Mark, uh, you talk about gold and silver in your in your entire book series. Um, are you really a fan of precious metals? I am. I'm a stacker for sure. And I guess probably the main reason for that is that it's always been money. Genesis 13 two says that Abraham was wealthy in cattle and silver and gold. So, uh, he, he was also into commodities, which, which, which is cattle there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, two thirds of what it says, uh, caused him to be wealthy is gold and silver. So uh, that's been recognized as a store of value since that's the beginning of time. You've got 12 chapters before Genesis 13, 2, and actually I believe in, in Genesis 2, I believe it also mentions the, the gold in, in the, the land of Havala uh, and, its, and its purity and, and things of that nature. But uh, So it actually mentions it a little bit before that. But for all practical purposes, that's the beginning of time. So we don't you don't have a lot of history before Genesis 13. So uh, that's pretty much the the beginning of time. The U.S. dollar in its current complete fiat form has only been around since 1971, since Nixon closed the the, the gold window. Uh, up till that point, the gold uh, the dollar was at least fractionally backed by gold, and so now it's backed by. Absolutely nothing, unless you want to say that it's lead backed. You know, there's there are people that would say that we have a lead backed dollar because we have a if you you count in the black box spending from the CIA and NSA and everything, we have a trillion dollar uh, per year military budget. So we do have a, a, a bigger military budget than all of the rest of the world combined put together. So. Um, you could say it's a lead back dollar because if you quit selling uh, your oil in dollars like Iraq did or Libya did, um, we're going to come over there and open up a can of democracy on you. So, so uh, um, the do other than other than lead or, or oil, maybe you could say that it's a, it's a petro dollar. Also, other than that, uh, there's not anything that's officially backing the dollar. And that gives the Fed the ability to just create more money infinitely. And, and they've been doing that for the past couple of years. They've scaled back QE to about half of what it was last year. But at its peak, we were printing $85 billion per month, which uh, over the course of a year was just over a trillion dollars in new money creation every year. And... Uh, the M2 money supply, which they quit counting M3, I guess, because they just got tired of uh, giving us fake numbers anyway, so they just got rid of that, that number altogether. But uh, the M2 money supply is right around $10 trillion. So by creating another trillion dollars a year, you're increasing the, the money supply by by 10% annually. So, And that's inflation. Uh, a the economists, most of the, the, the Keynesian and mainstream economists and the people that you'll hear on CNBC will tell you that inflation is the the price increases of goods and services. But uh, but that's not really what inflation is. Inflation is an inflating of the money, the monetary supply. So uh, if you create 10 percent more money, you have 10 percent inflation. The price increases are the inevitable effects of creating more money so uh, when, when you when you create 10 percent more money it's not going to all flow into all goods and services evenly so you're going to get bubbles some things are going to go up 20 percent some things are going to go up five percent but everything is going to eventually go up in price and you're going to see those price inflations uh, the, the price inflation because it is an inevitable um, consequence of creating more and more money and then the, the Fed money creation, that, that's also how we fund uh, the welfare state and the warfare state because uh, uh, we're spending more money than we can bring in in revenues, even though our top-tier tax, uh, top tax rate is 39.5%. Uh, 
which doesn't calculate whatever you have to pay for for sales tax in your state, and it doesn't t take into account your uh, fifteen percent uh, for Social Security and and Medicare, and it doesn't take into account your your property taxes, and it doesn't take into account your your state income taxes. So. Despite the fact that we are getting taxed to death, literally, um, it's still not enough. So the Fed still has to create more money. And, and even in creating another trillion dollars annually, that's still not enough. They still got to borrow more money on top of that, which is uh, now has us over $17 trillion in debt. And uh, and we have to keep the zero interest rate policy because if the interest rates get any higher, then they're not going to be able to print enough money without completely destroying the dollar to pay that off. And so we're just we're just piling up more and more negative energy in into this economy, which is almost like a rubber band. And if it would break right now, you know, the rubber band's going to snap both of your fingers and it's going to hurt a little bit. But the further you stretch it. Without it breaking, when it does finally break, the more it's going to hurt because it's going to snap back and hit your finger that much harder and it's going to hurt that much more. So every day that we delay the collapse, which I believe is inevitable, uh, I, I think the worse it's going to be. And, and I think that gold and silver are the best hedge for that. And, uh, and anytime you've had monetary collapses, um, you'll often see – Societies going back to gold and silver. It happened in in Rome. Uh, they continued to devalue their currency and, and debase it and, and take the silver out and put more copper in, and uh, and uh, just con continue to devalue their currency. And we saw we saw their empire fall apart. And I think we're doing exactly the same thing. And it's not something that might happen. Uh, it's something that always happens to fiat currencies, that they always fail. Uh, I, think, uh, I think China had the first paper currency uh, hundreds of years ago, and it failed. Um, and I think since that, I think there's been around 500 and 550 fiat currencies. Uh, I'm sure somebody out there probably knows the exact number, and I'm sure that's not it, but it's, that's a ballpark. Uh, in 2001, we saw Argentina's currency completely collapse, and uh, they anybody that had their their wealth stored in gold and silver, they they maintained their wealth. But if their if their wealth was in uh, the currency, the peso, the Argentinian peso, they lost everything. And I think everybody's probably familiar with the the. Stories from uh, the Weimar Republic after World War One in Germany, where monetary creation just went through the roof, and you would literally have to go to you would have to go to uh, the grocery store with a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread. And uh, but people that had converted their their paper dollars into gold or silver before that hyperinflationary collapse. They preserve their wealth, and I think that's something that's always happened through time, that people that, that had the foresight to do that maintained their, their purchasing power with gold and silver. And, uh, and Zimbabwe, the same thing happened there. I have, I have a Zimbabwe bill, and it's a, it's a real banknote from the, from the Central Bank of Zimbabwe, and it's $50 trillion, and that won't even buy you a stick of gum. So that's that's why I buy gold and silver because uh, it's always been money and it's always going to be money. And you can't you can't just push a, a zero on your computer keyboard and create more gold and silver. It takes effort. You have to go and dig it out of the ground and purify it. And uh, which brings me to another topic uh, is is the price of silver. It takes about it's it costs the average miner about twenty five dollars to to bring it out of the ground, purify it, and and mint it. So I think right now at 19 bucks, uh, I'm not a I'm not a financial advisor, but just speaking for myself, I think it's a gift at this price. Well, I love your analogy of the of the uh, stretching rubber band because I think that's a that's a great one. People can grasp that. So uh, maybe it's going to hurt a lot when it when it snaps and breaks. Uh, the more we stretch it. So um, given all of that, what are you? Uh, 
doing? What have you been doing lately to build your level of preparedness? I'll sort of get on these little kicks, you know, I'll get uh, for a while there. It was all about composting and and uh, gardening and figuring out what I could grow here. And, and, and you know, you'll kind of uh, sort of master, not maybe, maybe not master, but you'll get comfortable with uh, with one skill. And then I'll move on to the next thing. And then after gardening, I think it was solar and, you know, and just, uh, and I built my solar kit and getting all that together. And then when I get it up and operational and I've learned enough to where I think that I'm efficient, then I moved on to the next thing. And, uh, lately it's been, it's been medical because, you know, even if we don't have the collapse, you know, I, with Obamacare, the new, the, the only way they're going to be able to handle this influx of all of these new people on top of all of the doctors that are saying that they don't want to deal with the billing, they don't want to deal with Obamacare, and there's just there's so many headaches involved. You've got a lot of doctors that are retiring early, and the way that they're going to make up for that is uh, through nurse practitioners. And so basically, you know, unless you have cancer or, or something very, very detrimental, you're probably going to be seeing a nurse practitioner instead of a doctor, which, you know... Um, I'm sure they're still much better than me just going on to webmd.com. But, you know, uh, at some level, you, you may end up being on these these long waiting lists like we see in other countries where they have socialized medicine. And you may become responsible for yourself and you may have to start taking care of things on your own. So uh, I, I've been getting into trying to learn about uh, medical stuff. And one of the things that that pushed me to do was to really look at my medical kit that I had in my bug out bag. And so then I, it was, you know, because there was that, that period in, in prepping where it was all about the bug out bag and how lean and how mean can you get your bug out bag, you know, to where you had like just the things you need in it and cut out all of the, the weight and the fluff and, uh, and really get it down to something that you could throw on your back and go and, and survive for 72 hours with if you had to. And, uh, and everybody's going to have a medical kit in their bug out bag. And, uh, and so I, I started really trying to work on that and make it just as lean and mean as I possibly could. And, uh, what I came up with was just a, a little Molly pouch and it weighs about a pound and a half, two pounds. And, uh, I've got, I've got all the essentials in there. I've got a, uh, I've got an Israeli battle dressing in there. I've got uh, Asherman chest seal, which is a, a one-way uh, chest seal. If you get a gunshot wound or a puncture injury in one of your, your lungs, what happens is every time you breathe in, you're, you're, you're pulling in blood into your lung and, uh, and air through uh, uh, an opening that's not supposed to be there. And what the Asherman does is it, it seals that up, but then it's got a one-way valve pointing out. So every time you breathe out, it'll push the blood out so that there's no blood leaking into your, your, your lungs. But then when you breathe back in, it'll close up so that the air is going back in your, your, your uh, nose or mouth and not through that hole in your lung. And, uh, right. and so uh, it, it's really, really great uh, life-saving uh, bandage. And then I've got quick clot in there. I've got EMT shears, which, you know, if you get a really, really bad injury, a lot of times you're not going to be able to get your jeans off or your, your jacket off or whatever, and it needs to be cut off. So uh, the EMT shears, you know, those will, those will cut through Kevlar. They'll cut through denim. Um, I saw a guy on, on YouTube cut a penny in half with EMT shears. So they'll, they'll cut through just about anything you can throw at them. And then I've got um, I've got the the Band-Aid tough strips in there, which you know they'll they'll stick to you even if you're wet, sweaty, bloody, whatever. Uh, that's a good thing to have. Uh, and then I got a nice suture kit in there. I got uh, I keep three nylon sutures, hemostats, uh, steri strips, which steri strips are the they're like a it's almost like a temporary suture that it's it's basically like duct tape for your skin, you know. And, uh, and you can, you can close up a, a deep wound with those temporarily, maybe until if you're in a, a firefight or a really bad situation, maybe it'll, it'll keep you from bleeding out until you can get to another location and, and get those, get the sutures in. And then I've got a, a TK4 tourniquet in there, which is a really, really good tourniquet, but, uh, small and compact, but very strong. 
Uh, I've got the betadine swabs in there so you can clean up the wound before you do before you do your suture because that's what they clean you up with in the hospital when they get ready to suture you is betadine. Uh, got a nice selection of, of gauze pads in there. A um, couple little Advil packets because, you know, sometimes you just have a headache, you know. <laughs> you don't need an Israeli battle dressing. You just need an aspirin or, a, or some ibuprofen. And then I've got uh, antibiotic gel because an infection is one of the, you know, if, if you don't have good medical uh, facilities and you get an infection, it can take you out. Uh, I've got uh, alcohol prep pads in there. Get hand sanitizer in there because if you do ever have to do any work on yourself in the field or are on the run, uh, that hand sanitizer, you can sanitize your hands and you can sa sanitize your, your equipment with, with the hand sanitizer. It's not going to be as good as boiling it, but it's a lot better than uh, rinsing it off in a, in a stream that you don't know what's in there. And I got burn gel in there, which is great for burns, but the, the primary in, ingredient in burn gel is lidocaine which will numb you up. So if you at, did actually have to do a little suture in the field, um, it's not going to be as good as an injectable lidocaine, but just that topical application of that burn gel uh, around that area where you're going to be doing the stitching or the suturing will numb that up a little bit to, to make it a little bit more bearable. And rubber gloves in there, of course. And, uh, and so I, I went through all of that, put all that together, and I thought, man, you know, this is a really good kitten, and I, I just I, I loved it, and I was just really really happy with it, and very satisfied with it. And uh, but it, I put a lot of time and research into putting that kit together, into making it that size, and trying to get all those essential things in there. And Quick Clot, I think I forgot to mention, that I have a Quick Clot in there as well. Which what Quick Clot does is it it sucks everything out of the blood except the platelets, and uh, the platelets is what causes you to clog up when you when you get an injury. So. Uh, I've got that in there as well. But uh, back to what I was saying, I put all that research into putting that together. And I thought, man, you know, this is it's a little bit of a waste to just do this for, for one kit. So I made up some more. And now I actually have those on PrepperRecon.com. And uh, I make those available for anybody that wants one. Um, they're 89 bucks, which includes shipping. And you can pick between Coyote or ACU or... Uh, all OD green. I got black, so I've got all the colors. So whatever color your bug out bag is, uh, I pretty much got the 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 Molly pouch that'll that'll uh, match the color, and then uh, and then you know it, it does have the Molly strap. So if you've got a, a, a chest rig or if you've got a Molly backpack, uh, you can attach it to that, or you can just throw it on your belt loop if you want. And they're they're about the size that they'll fit in your your glove box if you've got a bigger car or underneath your seat. Because, you know, that's all good stuff to have if you're, especially if you're a concealed carry person, because, you know, you got to figure the other guy might have a gun too, you know, and I know you're a better shot and you're a quicker draw, but if he squeezes off one shot before you quit breathing, it will ruin your entire day. So, uh, and then the 89 bucks, that includes shipping. And then also if, uh, if anybody, if anybody from any of your listeners want to order that as well, if they'll put in, uh, in the comment section, secrets of a survivalist, then I'll throw in uh, my first book in there autographed as well. And I'll throw that in the, in the, in the mail and, and ship that out. Uh, usually the next business day via priority mail. That's great. That's great. Appreciate that. So, um, do you think you live in what you would consider a sustainable community? No, I don't. I'm in South Florida right now. I don't know if you if you watch Drudge Report, but uh, on Memorial Day, we actually had to have the riot police come out for, uh, and they had to close down A one A, which is on the bait on the beach. It was it was essentially like a gang war over there. Really? And it, it was that. it was a couple of hundred guys out there, and they were throwing bricks and shooting each other and fighting, and it was all of the 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 uh, Broward police. The, uh, the Broward Sheriff's Office and Fort Lauderdale Police uh, had to do a joint operation down there. They had their, their mobile command posts. They had hundreds of cop cars. Everybody was in riot, full riot gear with shields and batons, and they had snipers with AR-15s, and uh, they had to lock down the entire area uh, Memorial Day evening. 
It was around 4 or 5 o'clock, and they just had to completely shut it down. And we'd already made our decision that we were getting out of the area, but you know, that's one of those things that just solidifies it and lets you know that you're doing the right thing. And so we're now in the process of of uh, fixing up our house and getting it ready to get on the market. And we're actually going tomorrow to do a little reconnaissance on a, a little bit smaller community that's uh, be much more survivable and it's much more conservative. And, uh, and, and so, and then from there we'll be looking for a bug out cabin, probably somewhere in the, the Cumberland readout as, uh, I think James Rawls or, uh, that might've been Joe Scalson that, that coined the Cumberland. I think he maybe coined Cumberland plateau. You just had him on. Did, did he talk about that at all? Uh, he talked about a uh, readout. He talked about certain types of areas. In fact, he kind of went through his, 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 um, his different areas and different ratings and, and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, he did say that um, where I live is a good place to be. So we're always looking for good people. So if you're, if you're interested in coming to the Appalachian Mountains, we'll be glad to have you. Yeah, well, that's where we're heading. So <laughs> good, 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 good. So maybe we'll good. maybe we'll see you there. Yeah, we'll and to, and uh, so yeah, and be so part of our part of our prepper group. The cool kids live up here, so yeah, uh, awesome, awesome. So we're we're so doing everything we can to to try to get the place in in uh, in 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 shape for sale. So if anybody that that is just looking for a really good place to uh, to film the zombie apocalypse in real time when it does occur, <laughs> uh, I got a deal for you. Yeah, I bet you do. I bet you do. And we're back with the Secrets of the Survivalist radio show. Mark, um, I understand you're going to be speaking at the Summer Survival webinar. Yes, I'm going to be presenting there. And uh, I, I, Jim and Cindy are just, they're just great. And I just know it's going to be uh, a really class act production because everything they do is just, is just the, the, the best of, of its class. Uh, I got the opportunity to go to their Life Changes Be Ready Preparedness Expo last November, and it was my first preparedness expo that I'd ever I'd ever exhibited at. But uh, everybody else there that that did multiple expos, they just said, you know, it's the best that there's ever been, and the the amount of speakers they had, the amount of information that was there was just absolutely incredible and I think that this is just great that they're they're taking this to the online format because uh, there's a lot of people that uh, couldn't drive all the way to Lakeland Florida to go to a prepper expo and they missed out on a lot of that that great information that was there and uh, and so now that they've got this and it's going to be it's, it's available for everybody every Tuesday and Thursday night and I, I think that that's just fantastic. And I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I am too. It's um, it's a great idea, and you can reach a lot of people. And uh, you know, I've done some webinars in the past, and um, you know, it's a great thing for people to be able to to attend. And then you know, they don't have to go anywhere to get home; they're already home. So um, you know, it works for them. In fact, it, it works for the speakers too, because uh, I'm doing a lot more of the uh, the webinar or appearing via Skype, and um, you know, as a as a speaker and presenter um i i i'm getting real real leery about traveling um all the way across the country and then knowing that i'm going to have a really really long walk to get back to my uh my survival retreat if, if we ever had a crisis during that time so um you know it makes total sense for everybody and, and i'm really uh, really glad that, that they're doing this and putting it on and they really are class people and it really seems like a class act um what are you going to be covering during the during the webinar? I'm going to be going over my seven step survival plan, which you know it's a, it's a good primer for somebody that's just getting into preparedness. But as a lot of people, when they first wake up to prepping, it's just overwhelming because you've got food storage. You got to, you're trying to think about how you're going to convert your fiat currency out of a, a paper that that may be worth nothing tomorrow, and you're thinking about. Uh, you know, how am I going to get all my money out of the system in, in case the, there is the derivatives bubble collapses tomorrow? And, uh, you know, how am I going to how am I going to secure my property and where should I move? And 
and and it's just mind boggling because there's so many things when you first wake up it's just overwhelming and i think what a lot of people do is they just shut down and they don't do anything and i think that's the absolute wrong thing to do so what the seven step survival plan does is it tries to break everything down into bite sized pieces and give you a priority list of you know let's get let's get these first things covered first and then let's move on to the to the next thing and, uh, you know, when I start with self, because I think that you are your number one survival tool. And I think that that includes getting in shape, being healthy, um, learning skills, because skills don't weigh anything. And, uh, you know, and nobody can really take them from you and, and being spiritually prepared. And, uh, for me, that means putting my faith in Jesus Christ, but, uh, and, and a lot of people think about spiritual preparedness and they're like, well, yeah, that's great because, and, and it makes sense for a prepper because, you know, uh, no matter how big your bunker is and how many uh, years worth of food supplies you have, uh, statistically, 10 out of 10 people still die. And on that day, you are going to meet your maker. And if you call yourself a prepper, it only makes sense to be prepared for that day. But there's a lot of practical application for that as well because, um, the rule of three, the survival rule of three says you can go about three minutes without air, uh, three days without water. I think it's three hours without uh, shelter in, in harsh conditions, uh, three weeks without food, and three months without hope. Anytime you hear a story of survival from a, a POW or somebody that's been through a really, really long, drawn-out ordeal, uh, a lot of times they're going to credit their faith as being the thing that got them through that because it's just really, really hard to survive and to keep going in harsh conditions and, and uh, depressing situations without hope. And for me, my faith is just it's it's just an, an eternal source of hope. So uh, I, I think that that's pro that's the number one priority. And once you get that down, then I think the number two thing you need to think about is your budget because. If you just create, take out the credit card and you go to Cabela's or or uh, another outdoor sporting goods store and just rack up the court credit card and you get all your bug out bag and you get your guns, you get your ammo, and you then you go online and you, you order some gold and silver and you get your beans and bullets and, and band-aids and all of that other stuff – you know, that's great, but now you just created your own personal stuff hits the fan moment by spending money that you don't have. And that's the whole reason that our entire country is going down the tubes because we're spending money that we don't have. And so I think the number two thing you got to worry about is your financial budget and get your financial house in order. And then from there, once you're in shape, once you're spiritually prepared, once you're, you're learning the skills, once you've got that budget down, then you can start thinking about all the sexy prepper stuff, the, the beans and the bullets and the band-aids. So, and then I do, and I go through that and, uh, and, and for a lot of preppers that have been doing this for a long time, uh, they're going to say, okay, that's great, but I don't really need a primer. But one thing that, uh, that seasoned preppers will tend to do is you'll kind of get into one thing and, and you'll sort of over allocate into that area. So, you know, if you're a ham radio buff, you might have just tons of ham radio equipment and you might even have a Faraday cage with a backup communication system in it in case there's an EMP. But you might be a little short on the on uh, food storage, and then you know you might if you're the food storage guy, you might be a little short on uh, on uh, home defense. So uh, the other thing that the seven step survival plan does is it brings balance into the whole thing, so that you don't get stuck in one area and and, and neglect the other area. So it's good, for, it's great for a beginning prepper, but it's also a good thing to. To bring you back to the basics and uh, and make sure that you've got balance in your plan for the season prepper. Good advice. Um, are there plans for other books from you in the near future? Yes, I'm going to be writing another trilogy, and it's going to be a little bit different than the Economic Collapse Chronicles. Uh, it's going to uh, it's going to track the last days in America from a, a little bit more of a biblical prophecy standpoint. And uh, it's basically going to pick up, it's going to be similar to American Collapse Chronicles. So people that, that enjoyed the Economic Collapse Chronicles, are they're going to enjoy the this next series as well. But uh, it's going to really get in depth to uh, 
a lot of the prophecy that's in the Bible and tie, tie a lot of that in with uh, the things that we're seeing in the headlines of the news today. I, I, it scares me. It scares me some of the some of the Bible prophecy. There's, it seems like we're so close sometimes. That, uh, so, um, yeah, we're coming to the to the end of our show here. Um, I always ask my guests to come up with five things they'd like to tell the audience that most people don't know. So, Mark, if you'd just like to kind of get into those things, uh, I'll just kind of let you go. Sure. Um, I guess number one is that long term food storage does not have to be expensive. Uh, people make it expensive. You know, there's a lot of MREs and things out there. And sometimes MRE is a good thing to have in your bug out bag uh, because you don't really have to do a lot of prep work. You can just open it up and 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 pull it out. But your bug out bag is really designed to keep you alive for 72 hours. So you know you don't need 20 cases of MREs for your bug out bag. You just need a few, and it doesn't have to be all MREs even in there. Um, but uh, for for your main staple food that you're going to store, uh, especially for people that are just starting out or especially for people that are really on a tight budget, beans and rice uh, are almost free. You can get you can get a 20 pound bag of rice, white rice for for about seven bucks at Walmart. You can throw that in a mylar liner that you can get for a dollar fifty on Amazon and throw it in an old uh, five-gallon bucket. And it doesn't really matter, you know, well, I probably wouldn't want uh, paint thinner that was in that bucket before, but, you know, it doesn't, I wouldn't even necessarily feel like it had to be a, a, a food-grade bucket because you've got that mylar liner, which is impermeable to insects, it's impermeable to light, and uh, unless it was some kind of a corrosive uh uh, material in there before it's it's nothing's really going to leach through that mylar liner um, and then you can just cap that bucket and throw that in a, in a, a cool dry place and that rice will last for probably over 20 years now the caveat on that is you want to you want to make sure it's white rice while brown rice is much better for you it still has the bran on the outside of it and that bran has oils in it and that will actually rot and will actually go rancid uh, over uh, they say a year but you could probably get away with two or three years on the brown rice and it's much healthier for you but it just doesn't have the shelf life that the, that the, the white rice has and beans beans will store for eight to 12 years as well, depending on what kind of bean you have. And in that mylar and stored in a, a cool, dry place, you can probably even go a little longer than that. So uh, beans and rice and beans, you can, you can pick up for about a dollar a pound at uh, dried beans at, uh, at, uh, at Walmart. Now, if you're buying all these beans and rice, you need to learn how to cook with them. We talked about in step one of the, uh, sur the uh, seven step survival plan, that skills is one of the things that you, you have to develop first and foremost and learn how to cook with the stuff that, that you're storing. And if it's not beans and rice, whatever it is, you know, if you just can't, if you can't stand beans and rice, don't stock beans and rice. But I would definitely encourage people to try to learn to cook with them and try to learn to like them because it is just a fantastic, cheap way to really boost your, your food storage plan and you can get several months of, uh, of food storage put away for for way under a hundred bucks with uh, with beans and rice. So long term food storage doesn't have to be expensive, and a lot of people make it expensive. If you got the money, you know, do whatever you want to do. But if you don't, uh, like I said, don't create your own personal stuff hits the fan moment way before the economy ever collapses by uh, paying too much for your food storage. Number two. Uh, gold and silver have been considered money since Genesis 13 too. You know, it's got the track record. The U.S. dollar doesn't. Uh, number three, and we mentioned this in the in the seven step survival plan. You're your number one survival tool, uh, and that's your body, your mind, and your soul. You know, everything that makes you you. Uh, that's that's your best survival tool, and uh, learning how to be resourceful and things like that. And number four. Uh, most of the people who predicted the 2008 housing bubble, uh, and that would be that would be John Rubino, that would be Peter Schiff, uh, a few other folks out there in that space, uh, they see very turbulent times ahead for us economically. So everybody that saw that one coming, see something else coming, and uh, Peter Schiff and John Rubino both uh, 
having been accurate and called the last the last collapse, uh, think that the next one that's coming is going to be much much worse, orders of magnitude worse, and uh, for all the reasons that that we mentioned earlier in the show. And number five, and this goes back to this goes back to uh, uh, you being your number one survival tool. Get in shape physically, mentally, spiritually, and financially. That's the best possible prepping move you could possibly make. Good advice. Good advice. So where can people in the audience find out more about you and your products? Most everything is going to be on PrepperRecon.com. So you can go over to PrepperRecon.com and we put out two shows every week. We usually put out a show on Monday. I usually put out a show on Wednesday. I try to usually do a little uh, Prepper-related Bible study on Sundays. And I try to dig up some uh, – I'm a big, I believe in YouTube university. So, uh, I I try to dig up some good informational or entertaining, uh, prepper related, uh, YouTube videos. And we try to have a Friday night at the movie. So, you know, there's, there's nothing on TV, you know, there's nothing (laughs) on TV, you know, I don't know. I'm a big 24 buff, so I do like 24, but outside of that, there's really not much on. So there's a lot more good content on YouTube and I, spend a lot of time digging around for good content on there and then when I come up with it I like to share it so I usually try to post that on on Friday nights and uh, and then all of our all of our podcasts are replicated to YouTube and that's just prepper recon there you stick in prepper recon it's gonna come right up uh, you can follow us on Facebook Twitter and the books are the books I have links to purchase any of the books through prepperrecon.com as well. You can type in the title at Amazon and they'll all come up and they're all available in in paperback, Kindle and audio. And the guy that does the audio uh Kevin Pierce, he's just I can't say enough good things about him as a, as a storyteller. He's just got that that storyteller voice that just really brings life to the characters and it's just it's like when I'm listening to it, I'm like, did I write this? Because he's just making a completely different thing out of it uh, when I'm listening to him read it. He just brings life to it, and uh, and it's just I, – I love it. So, uh, And that's available on – you can you can purchase it through Amazon, uh, which all the links are on PrepperRecon.com, or you can go straight to Audible and, uh, and sign up for it. And I think that they'll give you a, a free – if you've never bought anything from Audible – They'll give you your first book free, so you can check out the experience because you've got to download the their their uh, their file management system on your computer, and then from there you put you can put the files on any of your devices and listen to the book. So they'll give you the first one free just to get you to uh, to check out the equipment and to see how it works. So uh, go get American Exit Strategy free on, on Audible and, and check it out and see if you like it. If you don't like it. Don't ever get another one, but if you do, then you can get American Meltdown, you can get American Reset, and uh, and a lot of other good books on on audio. Especially that's great for people that don't have a lot of time to sit down and read, because everybody has to do yard work, everybody has a commute, uh, a lot of folks go to the gym, and you know, and you can and and those are all things that that your mind can be doing something, can be uh, enjoying a good book, as opposed to just uh, listening to the dribble that's coming off of the radio usually. Yeah, I know. We just, I know what you're saying. Well, um, this has been great. Really informative. Really appreciate it. So uh, I would like to thank our audience for joining us for this week's Secrets of the Survivalist radio show. I am Rick Austin, author of The Secret Garden of Survival, How to Grow a Camouflage Food Forest, as well as The Secret Greenhouse of Survival, How to Build the Ultimate Homestead and Prepper Greenhouse. And, of course, I'm your host here on the show, where each week we'll talk to the best, best off-grid prepping and survival experts to discuss their own secrets of survival. From retreat construction to self-defense to growing food, each week you learn something new that you can use for your own survival preparedness. This week, our guest has been Mark Goodwin of PrepperRecon.com. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate you being here. Oh, it was so good to be on this show. Thanks for having me, Rick. And to our audience, if you'd like to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Google+, or LinkedIn, just go to the Secrets of the Survival Show page here on the Preparedness Radio Network, and you can find all the links. Or you can go to secretgardenofsurvival.com. That's my website, and you can find the links. 
sign up for my newsletter and get discounts on my books. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next week. American Reset, the long-awaited conclusion of the Economic Collapse Chronicles, is now available. In Book 3, the ultimate contest between liberty and tyranny reaches the apex. The Bear family and their neighbors fight to survive the fallout of the meltdown and cling to the principles in the Constitution. Will the collapse bring an oppressive regime that enslaves the American people, or will the patriots prevail and guide the country back to freedom, peace, and prosperity? Get your copy in Kindle, audio, or paperback on Amazon today.